Good morning from California. My name is Will Chu. I'm the co-director of Stanford Storage X Initiative. Together with my uh, colleague Yi Tui, I am pleased uh, to welcome you to the final symposium of 2020. I think I speak for all of my colleagues here at Stanford that we are excited for this year to be over and can't wait for 2021 to begin. But before that happens, uh, let's do one more uh, scientific session. We have so far covered four topics on X. We had X equal fuel, X equal lithium ion batteries at terawatt hour, X equal heat. And to top this off, today we have X equal longer duration storage where we'll learn more about electrochemical technologies um, beyond lithium ion batteries. So to get us started, um, E will introduce our first speaker. E, please. Well, thank you, Will. Hi, everybody. This is E Trey uh, for material science as well. It's my great honor to introduce uh, George Crabtree from Argonne National Lab. Uh, Crab is so well known, um, he doesn't really need that long of introduction. Let me just mention a few uh, highlights of his career. Um, he is a scientist, you know, early days working on you know, high temperature superconductors, become so well known and his scientific contribution. Um, he has been elected uh, he was elected as a fellow of uh, American Physical Society. He was a fellow of American Academy of Arts and Sciences and also a member of National Academy of Sciences. In addition to his scientific contribution, he's also well known um, for his leadership contribution and uh, helping the science administration. He served as the associate director and directors, you know, a couple of times and the material science division in Argonne National Lab. He recently, or not so recently anymore, eight years now, has been serving as the director of the Bepe Hub, the J. Caesar. And uh, on a personal level, I know George is such a great person. He's willing to spend his time uh, with his colleagues, willing to spend his time to serve the community. Certainly many of us having the DOE research program would know. George is, have been serving as advisors one way or the other to the um, Department of Energy, particularly the basic energy sciences. With that, I would like to welcome George to come to the podium to introduce to us the latest and greatest stuff in uh, JC, sir. George. So, Yi, thank you so much for uh, such a wonderful introduction. Uh, and I do recall very finally our relationship and friendship that goes back many years, as you said. Uh, I'd like to thank you also for the opportunity to address this symposium, really an honor. Uh, and I would like to talk about the new subject, which we'll mention long duration discharge energy storage, lots of challenges. I would say more challenges than opportunities at the moment, uh, but we're working on those challenges. So what I would like to do is um, uh, first introduce the little uh, diagram on the right. That's the symbol of Jay Caesar, and I'll have a little bit more to say about that later. We believe that you should build batteries from the bottom up. So if you want a new battery with a new function, start at the atomic level uh, and design from there up. I would like to cover the applications need for long duration storage, flow battery challenges, and some, and some recent advances. That's what I'll do in my time. So first, um, some of the mega trends that are shaping the grid. And these are trends that are going to be around for the next couple of decades. Renewable uh, wind and solar on the grid, in 2019, that uh, uh, accounted for about 9% of the electricity. Predictions are by 2050, it may be 56% or actually much more. 
Uh, energy storage is being deployed on the grid in, I would say, prodigious quantities. It can be used for intraday firming of wind and solar on the minute or the hour time scale. Evening extension in the case of solar, get some solar uh, electricity after sunset. And what we wanna talk about today, consecutive day stabilizing. There can be two or three or even more days that are cloudy or, or, uh, or calm, and we need to stabilize the grid against that. Uh, storage is growing very rapidly on the grid, about 20 gigawatt hours now, and by 2050, predictions are 4,500. The third uh, mega trend, climate change, we're all seeing it. Uh, lots of outages in the power grid due to hurricanes, due to flooding, due to wildfires, and now, especially in California, due to wildfire risk. And I think, in fact, in Southern California, uh, even this weekend, uh, lots of the power is shut off because of the fear of starting a fire. And finally, decarbonization, something which has really come to the fore since 2015 with the Paris Accords. Uh, and there's some very aggressive targets to decarbonize everything uh, by 2050 and the grid in particular in some countries by 2035. So there are lots of drivers for long duration energy storage. And uh, you can see here another mega trend and that is the cost of storage is falling dramatically. So this graph came out uh, about a year and a half ago by Bloomberg. They plotted at the bottom, here you see these yellow curves, the levelized cost of electricity for solar, two kinds of solar, and for wind, offshore and onshore, since 2009. And of course, solar is the poster child for, for dropping costs, down by uh, not quite a factor of 10, but getting close to it uh, since 2010. Uh, then they projected back the levelized cost of electricity from batteries, that's this dotted line, and remarkably it's falling even faster than solar and, and wind. A dramatic price change. Uh, and if you see now that storage is actually about a factor of four more expensive than wind or solar per kilowatt hour, that will be important in planning the grid. But you can also see by extending this line with your eye that eventually they're gonna meet and even cross. And if you look at comparing these prices with the cost of natural gas, here is the levelized cost of electricity from a gas peaker plant. And you see remarkably in 2020, it's about the same as the levelized cost of electricity from a battery. So you might expect that gas peaker plants will be ripe to be displaced by batteries. And even more interesting, if you plot the levelized cost of electricity from a combined cycle gas turbine, it's the cheapest way of producing electricity nowadays, it's pretty much comparable with the price from solar panels. So you might expect, again, by extrapolating these falling cost curves for storage and solar and wind, that eventually the grid, simply for economic reasons, will switch uh, from fossil to renewable. Uh, let's turn to long duration discharge storage. Here is an interesting graph or set of graphs from January of 2019. This information is kept by the University of Texas. And this looks only at the solar insulation measured in different ways, diffuse and direct and so on. But the point is there are many days when that are cloudy, at least in Austin, Texas. And you see in particular here from the 21st to the 24th, you see four overcast days in a row. Well, we need to, if we're going to have uh, a carbon-free grid, we need to back up or stabilize against those days with some form of energy and storage from batteries would be, a, would be an obvious choice. The problem is that lithium ion batteries, which is the most popular battery today and the biggest one being installed on the grid, can only discharge at full rated power for four to six hours. And that's fine to extend the day past sunset a few hours, but not good enough uh, to stabilize the grid against consecutive overcast days. So here's a graph from Paul Alberta's recent paper this year that shows the required 
uh, hours of battery storage or some other kind of storage versus the percentage of wind and solar on the grid on the x-axis. And of course, it goes up rather dramatically. This is a log scale uh, simply because um, you can use uh, batteries to replace the gas peaker plants that only operate a few hours, four to six hours at a time. But there are plenty of gas peaker plants that operate for a longer time, and those require uh, longer duration storage. So uh, this simply illustrates that if you want to have a completely carbon-free grid, 100%, you're going to have to have somewhere between 500 and 1,000 hours uh, of continuous storage discharge. And this, of course, is well beyond what lithium ion can do. Uh, so there are lots of candidates for this kind of uh, long duration discharge storage. Of course, redox flow batteries we're going to hear about today. Thermal storage, pumped hydro, compressed air, gravity storage, gas peaker with carbon capture and utilization, and a hydrogen peaker plant or, or fuel cell. So we'll talk about some of these. Uh, I talked about the cost of uh, batteries and uh, solar panels. And that introduces a very interesting question, which remains, I think, unanswered. How do you balance the ideal grid between solar wind storage and transmission? We'll leave hydrogen off for the moment. So because solar panels are so cheap, you might say, well, let's overbuild and we'll have a lot of curtailment, uh, but that'll be the cheapest option. On the other hand, batteries are coming down in price. And if you install batteries, you don't have to overbuild the solar so much. And of course, you don't have as much curtailment. And at some uh, price point, that will become an attractive alternative. If you look at the transmission lines, which are another way to share uh, cur otherwise curtailed solar and wind energy, they're probably the most expensive thing to build. On the other hand, there's a lot of them already in place. And how can we make the best use of that? And that's what we want to do, of course, to deliver electricity to the distribution, distribution grid where the users are. Now, you might ask, why do I have hydrogen in the title of this? I haven't talked about hydrogen. But there is another option, and that is to use all this cheap renewable electricity to electrolyze water and produce what's known as green hydrogen. If you do that, it's interesting that it's very inexpensive to store even for long periods, essentially infinitely, in tanks or underground. It's very inexpensive to build pipelines compared to the cost of a transmission line. So it's a, a cheap way to transport energy. And using fuel cells or simply burning hydrogen in a combustion turbine, you can produce electricity and supply effectively any need in the distribution grid. So it's a kind of a shadow grid, another energy carrier for electricity that has all the versatility of electricity and it's completely interchangeable with electricity. So it could do a lot for us. It can actually do more than this. So hydrogen has the potential to decarbonize things that electricity can't touch. Things like long haul trucking, things like maritime shipping, maybe across the ocean, Things like uh, flight, burning uh, Airbus just announced recently, it has a five-year plan to make a purely hydrogen long-haul aircraft. And heavy industry, I'm thinking of uh, cement and steel making and petrochemicals, which use a lot of fossil fuels that could be replaced by hydrogen. So there is an opportunity here to think of a new energy carrier, very complementary to electricity, with multiple options for solving problems, uh, such as zero emissions, such as low cost, such as high reliability and fast recovery. So this is something that is worthy of a lot, I think, of attention. Uh, if we uh, look now, let's turn to organic redox flow batteries. We all know how a lithium ion battery operates. Lithium oscillates between the anode and the cathode, storing and releasing energy. It's chemical energy which is stored in the two electrodes, anode and cathode. Uh, the power is restricted by how fast the lithium can move 
in the electrodes and in the electrolyte. And the energy is restricted by the storage capacity of uh, the anode or the cathode. So with organic uh, redox flow batteries, it's a little bit different. The active ingredient, the analog of the lithium, is confined in a tank. It never moves. It doesn't go back and forth. There's a negalite or, uh, or a, uh, an apozolite, uh, sometimes called analyte and catholite, which take the place of the electrodes. It's anions or solvent ions that move back and forth across a separator that uh, carry out the redox reactions. The power is limited by the area of this reaction plate separating the two tanks. And the energy is limited by the size of the tanks. So the power and the energy can be completely decoupled. This is great because you have the tank as large as you like. You can store as much energy as you like. That's great for the grid. Uh, you have liquid electrodes, so there's no strain due to volume change when you charge or discharge. That gives a long lifetime, maybe 20 years or even longer. Uh, and because uh, they're organics, there's lots of design space. So there are thousands to millions of organic molecules you can think of that would be useful as active ingredients in uh, the organic flow battery. So there are also challenges. Low solubility, that means you have a low energy density. You always want to get the solubility up. And crossover, unintended, of, uh, of the active ions from the analyte and the catholyte tanks, which ultimately uh, degrades performance and limits the lifetime. So if you look uh, first a little bit about a battery that is actually not organic, uh, but is a flow battery, but made with ordinary uh, elements. Uh, and this is a battery that was uh, delivered, well, developed in J. Caesar. We started to look at the problem about 2015. We were looking for problem for batteries that were made from ultra low cost earth abundant materials, things like water, things like, uh, like oxygen, things like sulfur of which there's plenty because it happens to be a byproduct of refining petroleum. Uh, and we developed a, a long duration battery based on these earth abundant low cost materials, uh, which we have the IP on. In 27, 2017, two years after we started, we spun out a company called Form Energy. They were very aggressive in getting funding within two years, $50 million from these sources. And in 2020, just three years after we spun them out and five years after we started to look at the problem, they signed their first uh, delivery contract with Great River Energy. That is Minnesota's second largest utility to deliver a battery, remarkably, that can discharge at full rated power for 150 hours. Very different from the lithium ion battery limited to four or six hours. So this is the first step. We'll see how it works in the field be delivered in 23. Uh, and I'm sure there will be lots of improvements along the way, but this is quite a breakthrough milestone. Here are some of the founders of the of, of Forum Energy on the left. Turning now to organic, so that was a water-based battery. Uh, why do you want organics? Well, many compositions and structures uh, for organic molecules, so there's a very large design space, and some of them are shown over here, give you an example. You can uh, go with, try to get high solubility, that would give you high energy density, high stability, so you would get long calendar and cycle lifetimes. You, of course, organics are, are made from earth abundant, low cost elements, carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, and so on. You can look for multi electron transfer, that is, two electrons transferred on each redox reaction. That would give you higher capacity and higher energy density. Uh, lots of organic solvents uh, that you can choose from. They may have wide working windows, wider than that of water. That gives you high voltage and therefore high energy density. You would co-design the membrane with the active organic molecule to prevent crossover. And you could design the battery to self-report its state of charge, its state of health, degree of degradation, and maybe even self-repair itself. And this is something that Jay Caesar is looking on. What are the challenges? Well, the biggest one really is that there's a wealth of molecular compositions and structures. 
how do you even start to assess that excess, that space? And uh, you have to find and design molecules that satisfy multiple requirements. That's a tough one. Maybe as many as three or four or five requirements at once. And they often conflict with each other. Yeah, here is a way of uh, attacking that problem of such a huge uh, design space, so many molecules. Imagine that you want to achieve some properties for a flow battery. Solubility, stability, voltage, crossover, multi-electron transfer, whatever it is. And imagine that you have some molecules in mind that you may design to meet those uh, performance requirements. The traditional way is what's called direct design. And we started off, of course, most of human history. Let's just think of it. Let's think of a, of a material that might satisfy this. Then we'll make it in the laboratory and see if it works. That was dramatically changed when we started to do computational screening. So we can do high throughput simulation of hundreds, maybe thousands of molecules on the computer, a lot faster than doing it than synthesizing them in the laboratory. And then take the best, uh, most promising uh, uh, candidates from that computer screening. So that speeded up things actually dramatically. There is another thing coming, sometimes called the self-driving laboratory, where you use artificial intelligence because of its knowledge of structure property relationships to start with the desired performance characteristics and uh, find or propose some molecular structures and composition that might satisfy those uh, performance requirements. So this is a new feature. So instead with AI, instead of simulating hundreds or thousands of molecules, you go immediately to the most promising five or 10 and consider only those. You could then have automatic synthesis. So the laboratory using a robot would make the material, automatic characterization, run it through lots of machines, uh, send that information back to the artificial intelligence brain here to score the material. Did it actually work? If it failed, I wonder why it failed. Let's try something else. And ev so it actively learns from every cycle of this uh, synthesis uh, route. Uh, and this is what's coming to the fore. So up here in the corner, I have what we are doing in JC's to do this. This is our design loop. We start with the seed material. We use uh, quantitative structure property relationships as our AI. We can get much more sophisticated than that. Automatic synthesis, high throughput characterization. We've got multi-objective targets and that's critical for, for flow batteries. We get some data and we learn from each experience every time you go around this loop. So here on the left are a few of the targets that are central and you can see electrolyte conductivity, membrane conductivity, viscosity, diffusivity, solubility, rate constant. Uh, and what's shown here is the properties of various organics normalized to what a vanadium flow battery would do. That's this uh, dotted line. And you see in some cases we're better. In some cases we have a ways to go. But we've already perfected in J. Caesar every stop on this loop. It is not yet fully automated, but nevertheless, we can carry out that loop and get the benefit. So I want to now end with three examples of satisfying multiple performance requirements. And the paper is up here in the left-hand corner, as it will be for all examples. Here, we decided to design for high operating voltage and high stability using structure property relationships and computational prediction. And interestingly, this group, uh, it's Melanie Sanford and her collaborators at Michigan, had previously published a molecule that had high stability, but only modest uh, voltage, and a second molecule that had high voltage, but only modest stability. And they wanted to combine their experience from uh, the, making those two molecules to make one that was high voltage, high stability, and high solubility. And of course, a lot, this is the molecule they made. Uh, along the way, they made lots of others, which are down here, will show uh, what they did. So here's the discharge capacity versus cycle number. So what you want is a very stable molecule that 
you know, doesn't degrade as you cycle, say, 300 times. And you can see this two plus, the bad performer, that's this guy that they started with. The one plus, which was very highly stable, that's this guy. And it's a little hard to see because they almost overlap. But this fellow right here performs as well as this uh, very best one that they started with. And all these others form uh, are intermediate between those two. What they showed is that multi-objective targets can be achieved. Uh, the derivative families must be explored carefully. So very small differences between these molecules, but very big differences in performance. Uh, so that's the first example. Now, this here the idea was to get two electron transfer on each redox reaction. And uh, that means you have three star charge states of the molecule. And of course, not sacrifice solubility or stability. So all three of those charge states have to have equal solubility. Turns out that's a challenge. And they again started with uh, uh, previous attempts at making molecules and made rather small changes. So this is just uh, derivative changes adding uh, elements to the molecular design. And finally came with this one and this one, these two, which were their candidates. Uh, and it turned out when you add two electron transfer, you can easily lose solubility. That's what happened on this trial. And you take, it takes additional functionalizing <clears throat> to restore that. Uh, so the system in which they, it's a symmetric flow cell here for probing the three charge states of this guy. This is their best performer. And you see here plots that you are very familiar with, capacity versus cycle number for, these are various uh, C rates, that is uh, power rates. And you see reasonable performance. Here's the theoretical capacity. Here is uh, at a constant uh, power rate and you see the theoretical capacity and over 140 cycles, that turned out to be 460 hours. So making some progress, not yet good enough, I think for the battery putting in a self-reporting feature into the active material. And the idea here was to use fluorescence because you can shine a light on it and uh, see how it responds. It's pretty non-invasive. You could imagine that that would measure the, the state of charge, the state of health, or in this case, the active species crossover between the analyte and the catholite tank. And it could be a potential trigger for rejuvenation, maybe you want to drain all the electrolyte and put in new at a certain point, or even self-repair. And these are, these are things that we have in mind. So they tried to add the fluorescent feature, self-reporting feature, to the molecules and found that it interferes with the electrochemistry. So starting with this molecule, high solubility, high stability, add the fluorescent feature and you lose the solubility and you get fast degradation. So that was pretty much of a disaster. Uh, here's another uh, version of this. And you see, it's not very different. It adds the CH3 element and slightly changes some of the others. Uh, and you're back to high solubility and high stability. The uh, very interesting experiment where they, using the fluorescence, monitored the crossover of the active material from analyte to catholite in real time. And, uh, they, and here are the plots. This is for uh, the same uh, active material and, uh, and it's in acetonitrile. And you see there's in both plots, there's an induction period here. That's the time it takes the active molecule to actually penetrate the separator or the membrane. And here, if you make 10 times uh, the contribution, 10 times the concentration, it actually uh, crosses over at a slower rate. That might seem counterintuitive, very interesting. And here, if you put a different solvent, then you see that the two solvents behave very differently. So they showed that indeed in real time, you can measure the crossover and it has some features. It depends on things that you might not have expected. This is our uh, Jay Caesar um, sort of uh, uh, diagram, we are trying to build batteries from the bottom up. We want to start with crystals, with atoms, with molecules, put them together to make transformative materials, chemistries, and architectures by adjusting the atomic and molecular structure and use those transformative materials to build 
batteries that are actually designed for the application. Uh, next uh, click will show where we're going. We have three directions, one of which is redox MER design here in the center. That's what we've been talking about during this talk. We also look at liquid and solid solvation. What's the atomic and molecular basis for that? Because that controls almost everything that happens in a battery. And we're also looking at multivalent uh, ions such as magnesium, calcium, or zinc. Uh, and those would be the inorganic analogs of let's say dual electron organics. And the motivations will, uh, you can see at the bottom, I won't read them to you. We make extensive use of, uh, of, of uh, computational screening, both for uh, crystals and for liquid electrolytes, which we call the electrolyte genome. And uh, we also are now putting in machine learning, which I think is the next big phase. So bottom-up design of redox active organic materi materials is certainly within reach. Here's our system. Many simultaneous design targets are required for a successful battery. Here's a few of them. It's a real challenge for conventional human Im imagination plus trial and error. It's almost, uh, I would say, impossible for that conventional route to really survey the space available. Inverse design with machine learning, that's the next step, that's what we're doing. And we have this, we call our self-driving laboratory, we call it an automated experimental machine learning platform with this little abbreviation. So with that, I think I am done. And the next slide, I believe, says thank you. Well, thank you, George, for the uh, introduction. What's happening inside the season on long duration storage. Um, so George, let me uh, start by asking a question of um, the definition of long duration first. Every time I use long duration, I'm thinking about 10 plus. Right. Uh, it's the same uh, definition right here. Well, 10 plus is on the short side. Yeah. Uh, we, we saw uh, in the Austin data that there are often four cloudy days in a row. If you look over uh, greater time spans, it can be as much as 10 days in a row. So yeah. I think 10 hours would be on, on the low side. If we're serious about decarbonizing the grid, uh, we need much longer. Even 100 hours may not be enough. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, that's uh, uh, basically the low end is 10. So that, that's a, a similar uh, that definition. OK, um, so one question. First question is, George, um, we know lithium ion is going down to on the path and the system level get down to $150 per kilowatt hour, and then and also go down to 100, probably in a few years, right? Um, so if you look at the long duration storage, for example, about five days, let me use uh, five days, or maybe a week. So let's say every year, uh, you have about what about 50 cycles, 60 cycles to use uh, for, for that, how many days, you know? Um, and what will be the cost needed? I think there's uh, certainly analysis in the literature uh, about what's the cost target we, you need to go down to per kilowatt hour uh, of uh, storage costs, right? The capital investment. Um, what's the target they see that really like to enable? Uh, to meet the long duration storage? That is a great question, Yi, and, and one that has been analyzed, but I think not enough attention has been paid to it. And let's take an example. Let's say you had a lithium ion battery, it could discharge for four hours. And you said to yours, and it cost you $100 an hour, uh, kilowatt hour. And you said, well, I want to make it eight. The obvious solution is to buy a second battery. Then, of course, you can get eight hours out of it. The downside, you've doubled the cost per kilowatt hour. It now costs you two, twice as much as it did before uh, because you have the second battery. And that's the problem. You need a decreasing cost for the longer uh, storage discharge duration. So in Paul Alberta's paper and many other papers, there are targets uh, depending on the length of the discharge time. And if I'm remembering right, for 100 hours discharge time, the cost has to be something like $3 a kilowatt hour to compete with uh, existing technology. If you want more than 100 hour, uh, hours, it, it has to go down proportionally. 
it may seem impossible to achieve those goals, but certainly with redox flow batteries, when you just make the tank bigger, you don't have to make more batteries, that it's possible that you could get the price down. And some of the estimates, techno-economic modeling that, that have been done suggests that that may be a viable route. Yeah, yeah, it makes sense because if you couple the power, the energy with the power for the redox flow batteries. So George, uh, the second question is, um, uh, you talk about uh, non-aqueous, the organic redox. I, I think Mike is going to talk about that as well later, maybe in the panel discussion, we can go deeper. I, uh, during your talk, I keep thinking about the, the aqueous route versus non-aqueous route, right? In aqueous route, there is vanadium redox flow, there is uh, a number of other chemistry uh, available right there. If you will analyze this from the high level and compare aqueous uh, versus non-aqueous, right? Uh, what will be the difference in terms of opportunity can enable the long duration storage? Yeah, and I, th that's another great question. And there are some techno-economic papers, we can, I can send some references, you probably know them already, that look at exactly that question. And the conclusion seems to be that the advantage of non-aqueous is you have lots of choice of solvent, so you may be able to design a little bit better than you can with aqueous, which is limited to water. Uh, and you might get a higher voltage because water, of course, electrolyzes at 1.23 volts. You'd like to work at maybe four volts and that would give you a lot more energy. Um, and those are the advantages. The disadvantage is the cost. And it's not so much the cost of the elements that make up the organic uh, molecules, they're, they're cheap. It's the synthesis cost. It can be very hard to synthesize complicated organic molecules. So the cost goes up, whereas with water, uh, you can almost say nothing could be cheaper. And so where uh, the non-aqueous batteries may have higher operating voltages and they may be able to be designed a little bit more uh, perfectly, let's say for the application, the aqueous uh, batteries have much lower cost uh, and they have the advantage that they're already out there. You mentioned the vanadium redox flow battery, which has been commercialized for more than a decade. So there's more experience with them. And I think those are some of the trade-offs. Mike, uh, in the panel discussion, they like to add to that, of course. Yeah, yeah. I probably will wait until the panel after the mic, uh, you know, also give the talk. Uh, so from the audience, there's a question. Also, George, by the way, you know, in Zoom right here, we only see a limited number of audience, but it's huge audience <laughs> watching on a different line right there, so not visible to us. Uh, I have uh, David Boy right here feeding me the questions. Um, so one question is, you mentioned for the long duration storage, for the, this whole system level of uh, you know, hydrogen, showing up um, as very attractive. Uh, we know hydrogen was um, intensely looked at maybe more than a decade ago and in, in the early, you know, previous administration. Uh, and, and look at the hydrogen. What are the challenges for storing large quantities of hydrogen, you know, for extended period of time? Or maybe let me just add in my comment as well. Overall, the whole hydrogen economy, you know, we talked about more than a decade ago. Now we kind of revisit this. Uh, and what are the challenges we need to overcome? You know, what's, what's different right now in, to enable us to make it possible as a viable solution? Yeah, I think this is one of the most interesting questions and probably for the next decade will remain an interesting question. So you mentioned the hydrogen economy and it was, oh, 10, 15 years ago that we looked at it seriously. We were thinking at that time that it was just fuel cells and we were not thinking at that time climate change. So we never mentioned the word climate change and hydrogen in the same sentence. Now we do all the time. Climate change has really come to the fore and even uh, amongst, uh, you know, uh, let's call the general public Climate change has, has, they all think it's an issue. So where's the challenge? 
And I think the biggest challenge is producing green hydrogen from electrolysis of water uh, cheaply enough. Right now, it's three or four, sometimes five times as much as the hydrogen you get from uh, steam reforming carbon dioxide, and that, of course, produces uh, mm -hmm. steam, steam reforming methane, which, of course, produces carbon dioxide. So uh, that's the challenge. Uh, we didn't have 15 years ago cheap renewable energy that was carbon free. I completely, now agree. Do. I completely agree. It's a different time right now. Yes. Uh. It's a very different time. So I think this is the major issue. And I go back to the graph I was showing of the dramatically uh, falling costs of both solar panels and batteries. That's because of demand. So if indeed Asia and Europe, which has already signed on to hydrogen as a second energy carrier, mostly for decarbonization reasons, um, if they drive up the demand as that's expected will happen, the price could do a similar, let's say, learning curve fall. And predictions are it could come down to $2 a kilogram, maybe a dollar a kilogram, which would make it completely compatible with present fuels. So although that might be 10 years off, as it was for solar panels and for batteries, yeah, it's something that we should look forward to. Yeah, George, I agree. You know, in some of the region now, PV electricity costs it already, uh, the price, actually selling price, uh, purchasing price is already less than two cents per kilowatt hour. That's my feeling. Two cents as renewable hydrogen becomes very interesting. 1.5 cents, there will be large quantity generated, low cost enough. If you get to one cent, then it's game changer completely. Uh, uh, we, are, we, are, we are on the trajectory of, of, of doing that. I mean, it's thinking about green hydrogen is, uh, I think absolutely making sense. So with remaining time, uh, maybe I'll just ask one more question before I invite uh, 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 Mike and uh, Will uh, to, to, to come to the podium to introduce Mike. Um, well, in terms of the cost of the uh, organics redox flow, right? I mean, membrane is very, very important, but certainly the membrane part, that is, that's the device determining the power. So what, what's your feeling or anybody's calculation? How low cost membrane needed to be per meter square right, to really enable, let's say $20, $20 per kilowatt hour, even $10 or below uh, per kilowatt hour of the cost and for the uh, flow batteries? Great question. I don't have a number for you, but I can tell you the following. Uh, and I didn't mention it in, our, in my talk, but we're looking not only at single molecules, monomers, but at polymers, typically maybe oligomers, three to six, uh, you know, monomers mm -hmm. long. And the big advantage of that is they're big. So if you use size selection as your membrane and you make your polymer, let's say three or four times the size of a monomer, suddenly uh, the crossover problem is dramatically reduced. And it, comes, it becomes reduced not because you made a better membrane, but just because you made a, a bigger active molecule. We are looking at that as a serious way to get the cost down, but you're absolutely right. The membrane needs to be looked at, and it needs to be looked at in conjunction with the active material because that's the thing you want to screen against. So you can use charge rejection, you can use size rejection. There are lots of ways to, to address that problem. And I think we're only at the beginning of, of starting to explore. Yeah, so that, that is good. Um, so in terms of the component, um, you know, there's one, one um, audience asked questions. Uh, overall for the redox flow, you know, what's the most important feature, right, George, right here? You know, there's a number of things the, this, this person are listed. Is the redox potential? Is it heterogeneous kinetics? Is it the electrochemical reversibility? Is it solubility? Is it transport property? So what, what's important? Um, I, I think you mentioned in your talk, there's a couple of things, I mean, stand out first, but I mean, probably just re-emphasize what, what are the important properties you are, you are really looking for? Yeah. So, I mean, that is a great question. And to give a, a generic answer, you have to find molecules that satisfy many of the properties at a single time. So to bring out one and ignore the others is probably a failure. 
But the two biggest problems in my mind are the crossover problem, and that can be affected by the membrane as well as by the molecule. But that's endemic everywhere in flow batteries. Uh, that's the first problem. And the second one actually is cost. You want to have a, a molecule that performs you know, many functions, but also doesn't cost much. And that's a really tough challenge. On the other hand, let me be optimistic. There are thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands of candidates out there. We just haven't found the right one yet. Yeah. Okay, uh, uh, George, with that, um, I would like to thank you for your talk and uh, certainly remain online. I'll, I'll invite you back uh, to the panel discussion later. Now let me uh, pass the podium to uh, Will Chair and uh, he's a young boy right there participating early, early career scientist. All right, E, thank you very much. And George, I, I must say your presentation was extremely exciting and entertaining that my son, who I think is the youngest viewer of the symposium, was uh, keeping great attention. So um, I'm also very pleased and honored to introduce our second speaker for today's uh, long duration storage session. Uh, professor Michael Aziz uh, is a professor of materials and energy technologies at Harvard University. He is the co-inventor of the organic aqueous flow battery for which he received the uh, 2019 Energy Frontier Prize from any. He is um, the fellow of the American Physical Society, the Materials Research Society, and the American Association of Advancement of Science. Um, with that, okay, that's, that's my cue, Mike. Go right ahead. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks to both of you for the kind introduction. That's the youngest introducer that uh, I've had ever makes me feel young at heart. All right, I'm pleased to be with you this morning to talk about uh, our exciting new flow battery chemistries. I'm not a chemist, but I collaborate with two terrific chemists, Roy Gordon, experimental and synthetic chemist, Alana Spuruguzic, theoretical and combinatorial computational chemist. And uh, thanks to George for introducing flow batteries. I really don't need to spend any time introducing them for grid storage. I have just one slide. Uh, I will introduce aqueous soluble organics. So the it's not a choice of aqueous or organic. Right? The, the big choice is aqueous or non-aqueous. And then the second big choice is soluble, uh, aqueous soluble organics or aqueous soluble inorganics. At least those are the choices I faced. Uh, and I'll talk a little more about that later. Uh, I'll show some of the performance of our most competitive chemistries now, their major challenges, and where we're going from here. Uh, as you've heard, the wind doesn't always blow. Here's three weeks of wind. The sun doesn't always shine. Three weeks of sun. The city always needs power. In fact, the, the cover slide uh, is this photo here. It's Boston a view from across the Charles River in Cambridge, where I am. Uh, obviously, the sun isn't shining and the wind isn't blowing. The city's brightly lit. We're burning fossil fuels, and we, want, we need to stop doing that. So the role of storage is to permit that, taking what nature chooses to give us and turning it into what we need. And what you've already learned is the energy to power ratio is essential here. You need large energy to power ratios, because that ratio, megawatt hours per megawatt, is the number of hours over which you can discharge your storage system at its rated power before it's drained. Flow batteries are designed to get you cost effectively to large energy to power ratios. Unlike in traditional enclosed batteries where the energy component and the power component are just rolled all together in one single jelly roll and you can't independently size them. In a flow battery, you have the electrochemical reactor that is going to determine your power rating the size of the membrane, size of the electrode, and then the energy rating is in the size of the tanks full of electrolytes. And so if you want high energy to power ratios, you're talking about big, dumb tanks. If 
the mass production cost of the electrolyte is low enough, then you can get to uh, costs at long discharge durations that you can't get to by stacking up banks and banks of solid electrode batteries. So this has been known for some time. There are uh, plenty of flow battery chemistries that have been out there. Uh, what you need to do is get that curve under the curve where someone's willing to pay for it. And I just want to uh, take a couple figures from a paper I, I wrote with Bill Hogan, who's at the Harvard Kennedy School of Government. He's the world's foremost electricity markets expert. And we just asked the question, what would a battery, how cheap would a battery have to be to pay for itself at any node in the grid by arbitrage? That's the huge market arbitrage of buy low, sell high, and pay for your own installation. Uh, we got data over the PJM uh, organized electricity market. It stands for Pennsylvania, New Jersey, and Maryland, but it extends through Ohio, Indiana, Chicago. It's the biggest organized electricity market in the US and hourly prices are available uh, over this seven year period. So we got prices for every hour at every node where we had complete um, data. And there are two markets. There's a day ahead market where you know the prices, all the prices 24 hours in advance. So it's easy to figure out how to optimally charge and discharge your battery in order to maximize revenue. And then there's a real time market where you don't and you hope that with machine learning and so on, you can still optimize or approach optimum performance that way. But we just asked, suppose we did have perfect for foresight uh, with a battery of different energy to power ratios. We studied a variety of different uh, discharge duration batteries here. How cheap would it have to be in order to pay for itself at each of these nodes on the grid in each of these markets? And so let's look at the real time market, for example, for a 10 hour discharge duration battery. Uh, what this says is that at about $105 a kilowatt hour of capacity, if you could install it for that, you would have been profitable at 50% of the nodes. If you could install it for about $90 a kilowatt hour, you'd have been profitable at 75% of the nodes. And if you could install it at about $75 a kilowatt hour, you'd have been profitable at all of the nodes. <clears throat> now, uh, that price point under which you have to be able to install your battery goes down with increasing discharge duration because there's at longer discharge duration, there's fewer oppor fewer times when you get to completely discharge your battery without having a rest in between where you can recharge it. And, and therefore you get fewer paydays for, the for fully utilizing the longer discharge duration battery. So that brings the curve down. And flow batteries are hopefully getting uh, curves that will come down and cross below these things, whereas stacking up banks and banks of solid electrode batteries gives you some sort of horizontal curve uh, that peters out at some number. George said for lithium ion it was six hours, and that's, that's about what I think as well. So uh, vanadium redox is the most uh, commercialized flow battery technology out there right now. It uses four different charge states of vanadium ions in sulfuric acid separated by a proton conducting membrane. Uh, here's an installation in Japan, a five megawatt hour installation. You can see the tanks of uh, battery acid and the power conversion units there. That's a shipping container for scale. Ronka power in Dalian, China is near the end of completion, I believe, of an 800 megawatt hour of vanadium redox flow battery. So that's a hundred times bigger. So that's an enormous, enormous battery. The problem with vanadium is it's not a highly abundant element. Uh, it's not very cheap. And there are enormous price fluctuations because it goes into Chinese rebar, for example. So when construction heats up in China, the price of vanadium goes up. So we've been looking for ways of getting the performance of vanadium out of organics. The idea with organics is you have truly earth abundant elements, carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, 
nitrogen, sulfur. Uh, and so can we get this cost curve down uh, and drop down into competitive ranges at shorter durations? And we've made a lot of progress on this. I want to start our story with benzene. There's a benzene ring here. There's hydrogens on the corners. The chemists don't even draw those. Uh, and, but instead of hydrogens here, there's two hydroxys. So that is actually uh, called a hydroquinone. And at a certain voltage, that will spit off two electrons and the two protons will jump off and turn into this molecule here, which is called the benzoquinone. So the hydrogens are still there. So that's the oxidized form. That's the reduced form. And uh, it's a simple two electron, two proton, proton coupled electron transfer redox process. I started in this field of storage by working on inorganic ways of storing electricity uh, like many others, uh, but noticed that some groups were making progress using organics in fuel cells. And of course, a one-way fuel cell is half the problem, but getting it go forward and in reverse is what a flow battery is all about. I started talking with the chemists about finding molecules that would work in two-way operation in flow batteries. Uh, Roy Gordon, Ted Bentley, Alana Spuruguzic. We hit upon this one that's in photosystem two, picking up electrons from chlorophyll in photosynthesis, going between the oxidized form and the reduced form over and over and over again. That's exactly what you want to happen in a battery, but this tail makes it insoluble. These methyl groups uh, change the redox potential to a place that's not good. But with the, the beauty of synthetic organic chemistry is the chemist can do all kinds of things about this. So first step is uh, take the tail off, raise the, uh, uh, raise the number of rings, and now the redox potential goes down to a good value for a negative terminal for uh, an uh, aqueous flow battery. But that's not soluble. You can stick solubilizing groups on. And this is the first molecule that worked well with this. This was the start of the field of aqueous organic flow batteries uh, called anthroquinone disulfonate. Uh, that's a good negolite molecule. We paired it with a toxic corrosive bromine pozzolite. Uh, and there's actually a European company that's licensed that and is uh, using it for uh, utility and um, industrial scale, scale storage. but we've been looking at less toxic, less corrosive ways of storing energy. And that's where I really want to start the technical part of our story. We're looking for molecules that uh, will have different redox potentials because you can put different things on the rings and shift the voltage around. And you can oxidize one at the same time that you reduce another to charge it, and then just reverse these reactions when you discharge it. And the requirements, this is almost from the Q&A, one of the questions that George got, what's important? Well, these turn out all, all of these are important. And if any one of them is bad, it will kill you. But we need to look at redox potential. You want to be almost splitting water right, at high potential and low potential, but not quite. The solubility needs to be high to get a reasonable energy density. The kinetics need to be fast to get you a reasonable power density. The stability needs to be long to get you a reasonable lifetime. And the mass production cost needs to be low in order uh, to make these cost effective to produce. So let's see if my clicker is still going to go. Here we go. So here is our alkaline, our first alkaline flow battery from uh, 2015, I think. 2015, yeah. Uh, this molecule now with these hydroxy groups here is stable and soluble in base. And we paired it up with an old fashioned ferrofericyanide pozzolite molecule that's been around since the 1980s. Uh, it has cyanide in it, that sounds scary, but the reason cyanide is lethal is it attacks the iron and the hemoglobin in your blood. Here it's saturated with iron, so it's safe as long as you stay in as alkaline, neutral to alkaline pH conditions. If you go to acidic pH, you generate hydrogen cyanide, and that is certainly lethal. But in base, and here we're at pH 14, uh, it's stable and soluble. So here's our uh, dihydroxyanthroquinone. There's the ferrofericyanide. Uh, there's the single electrochemical cell and the pumps in the background there. 
that uh, were our first alkaline flow battery chemistry. And let's see how the performance of this chemistry uh, looks. First polarization curve, George showed you one of these, start at zero current density, and you can see the open circuit potential at about 1.2 volts, depends somewhat on state of charge uh, through the Nernst equation as it does for many batteries. And then you draw current out of this and the voltage drops because of internal resistive losses. You want the internal resistance to be as low as possible, but you can see we can draw over an amp per square centimeter of current density out of these cells. And for those of you working for in um, non-aqueous chemistries, that's not a typo. Okay, those are not milliamps, those are amps. These tend to be like two orders of magnitude higher than what you can get in non-aqueous chemistries. And that's why uh, one of the reasons why I believe in aqueous chemistries. So we have only maybe a third of the voltage of lithium ion batteries, but orders of magnitude higher currents. And so we can get higher power densities. That's lower area electrodes for the same amount of power rating. So the same data can be plotted as power density versus current density. Power density is simply voltage times current density. And if you do that, then instead of having to keep a whole curve in your head, you can keep a single number in your head, which is the peak galvanic power density. And here we're at about two thirds of a watt per square centimeter. Highest number ever published for vanadium is 1.3. So we're a little over half of what vanadium has gotten to, and they've been at it for 25 years. Of course, we learn from all their uh, tricks and, and publications. The other really important figure of merit for a battery is the uh, cycle life. And so we started cycling this little battery like uh, hundreds of times per day, and we extrapolated uh, and it looked like 10,000 cycle uh, lifetimes, and that looked terrific. It was only later we figured out that the lifetime had nothing to do with the number of times you charged and discharged the battery. The lifetime was simply calendar denominated. Homogeneous chemical reactions are happening inside the electrolyte and the molecule is decomposing. And so a fade rate that might be, you know, uh, half-life of 10,000 cycles turns into you're losing 5% per day. And that's completely unacceptable. And the way we figured that out is by starting to build symmetric cells. So here we have the same exact electrolyte at 50% state of charge on both sides. We call it volumetrically unbalanced, compositionally symmetric. Um, Mark Antony Goulet uh, developed this technique. Uh, and it works very well. You completely charge and discharge this side and any fade that you see is completely a function of what's going on in this side. Because it's symmetric, then having things cross over or worrying about things cross over doesn't matter. And here's what you end up seeing. If you're cycling, you're losing 5% per day. Stop cycling in the discharge state, fully discharge. You lose basically nothing here and here. No cycling for a day. If you stop at 50% state of charge, you lose maybe a 1% per day. You see that here and here. If you stop at 100% state of charge, you lose an order 10% per day. You see that here and here. So it's time denominated. It is not cycle denominated and you have to deal with this. Molecules don't need to last forever in order to be interesting compared to vanadium. They need to be cheaper and in which case you can fill your tanks at the beginning with a cheaper electrolyte and get down your cap capital cost. And then uh, the replacement cost gets spread out over future years and your interest rate for discounting needs to be high enough to make that worthwhile. So the trade-off comes down to this replacement cost ratio, taking the annual replacement cost and comparing it to the capital cost savings. And uh, where you break even depends on the project life. And I just have an example here for a 20 year project. Suppose the vanadium costs 100 units, but the organic costs 30 units and loses 15% capacity per year. Then this replacement cost ratio is 15% of your 30 units divided by the 70 units that you saved when you filled your tanks. And that's 0.064. And so you'd go over here and say uh, 20 year project 
breaks even at 2.3% interest rate. So if your interest rate for discounting is above that, then the organic looks favorable. So we've been working on in both of these directions. One is taking the low cost um, molecules and making them uh, increasing their lifetime. And the other is redesigning the molecule and getting truly long, uh, long lifetime, very stable molecules out of that. And I'll show you a little bit of both of those directions. Uh, here is, these are our low cost molecules, our first chemistry, our second chemistry. We were supported by ARPA-E at this point, and so we could afford a consultant from the chemical industry to uh, evaluate what the mass production cost would be at various scales. And when you have about a one volt battery, then a kilo amp hour is basically a kilowatt hour. And uh, so I think of this plot as the production cost of your chemicals per kilowatt hour, dollars per kilowatt hour versus the number of megawatt hours per year that you're going to produce. And what you see is that small scales, this is enormous. But when you get up to the scale of one Ronca power mega battery per year, which means like 180 million to build a factory just to build, just to mass produce your chemistry, then you're down at very reasonable costs. Here, DHAQ and ferrocyanide look like they'd be about there, but well, you've got to get there. And still that molecule um, doesn't last forever. So, on the next slide, we'll show how we can extend the lifetime of that molecule because uh, Mark Antony Goulet and Lushan Tong have looked into the decomposition mechanism enough to understand it. So uh, here's the oxidized form of the molecule, dihydroxyamphiquinone, right? But we're in pH 14, so the hydroxies have been uh, deprotonated. The hydroxide in the base pulls the protons off and these become O minus. And here in the reduced form, OH, becomes O minus as well. But it cycles between this reduced form and the oxidized form. When you charge it, you make this reduced form. And at high states of charge, there's enough of this reduced form to come around, or to go around that two of these will come together and disproportionate into one oxidized form and one over-reduced form. That's lost an oxygen atom. It's called anthrone. It's not redox active. And so you've lost it. And furthermore, these will dimerize and turn into other things that you'll never get back. But now that we know the mechanism, there are things we can do about it. First is don't charge all the way. If instead you just stop your charging at 88% of full charge, your fade rate is 1 40th of that uh, of when you go to 100% state of charge. So here, you're not charging fully, you see here you're charging fully, but it's fading fast. And here it's fading 40 times lower. Second thing you can do is expose it to air in just the right part of its charge discharge cycle. And this molecule picks up an oxygen again and turns right back into the oxidized form of the quinone. So I called this Lazarus quinone, the students called it zombie quinone. The stu students won, the press release called it the zombie quinone. And here, here's the zombie action, right? You've lost 70, uh, you've lost a bunch of your capacity. What Mark Antony did was he opened the reservoir, swished it around in air, closed it up, got 70% of that lost capacity back. So that's really encouraging. And we're working hard right now on uh, testing the proposition that these two effects are multiplicative uh, and that we, by combining them, we can actually get down to you know, hundreds of a percent loss per day. And at that point, uh, and we're closing in on that. And if we can do that with this very cheap chemistry, I think we have a um, viable candidate for a spin out. In the other direction, we've designed extremely long lifetime molecules. And on one slide, I'm going to attempt to cover about three years of development here. Uh, Dihydroxyamphiquinone has OH here and um, decomposes, but uh, David Kwabi and Kai Shang Lin put these arms on this molecule. Uh, this becomes what's called an ether linkage. The solubilizing group is now further from the ring and the ring is much more stable that way. Uh, and 
the capacity feed rate went down by two orders of magnitude, down to 0.04% per day. But still, the ether linkage is vulnerable to nucleophilic attack by this or this. <clears throat> right. Yunlong Ji brought the fade rate down by another factor of about three by replacing the carboxylate with a phosphonate group here. And the, the two reasons phosphonate uh, helps is first it's a it's a weaker nucleophile than carboxylate so phosphonate doesn't attack that as readily but second it's a better solubilizing group and that means we can bring the pH all the way down to nine and still have good solubility with this one pH had to be at 12 uh, for decent solubility now we're down at nine and so there's less hydroxide around to attack your vulnerable ether linkage and Finally, just this year, Min Wu and Yan Jing, whoops, before this year. Uh, you know, that's, this happened this year too. These molecules have been licensed by two specialty chemical suppliers. So uh, uh, potential collaborators who asked us, can we send them you know, a kilogram of this stuff so they can try it out? And we've had to say, I'm sorry, that would take a graduate student two years to make. Now you can go and buy it. So you can do your own experiments on these. But uh, this year, we developed an even more stable class of chemicals. Min Wu and Yan Jing have done this. By removing the vulnerable ether linkage completely and having just carbon linkage arms, these arms are truly bulletproof. You can see uh, the fade rate now is in the hundreds of percent, uh, thousandths of percent per day. That extrapolates to 3% per year for that one. And our current champion, dipevolic acid amperquinone, uh, with a more complicated arm here, gets you down to less than 1% per year. And so I'll just show the performance of this one on the next slide to give you an idea of what's going on. Here it is in um, at pH 12 against ferrofericyanide. Open circuit potential is shown here versus state of charge, about one volt. Here are the polarization curves. Here's the power density. So we have about half the power density of DHAQ, which is still respectable. And when we cycle this, here's what happens. So here's the black curve is the discharge capacity versus time. Uh, and what we see is we're losing about 5% uh, per year when we uh, discharge fully cycle at pH 12. What um, Min did here was he stopped and exposed to air and we recovered capacity, same mechanism as DHAQ and dropped some KOH pellets into the uh, uh, negolite and got the pH up to 14. And now we have this world record uh, capacity. So my, as far as I understand, this is the lowest capacity fade rate in the absence of rebalancing techniques for any flow battery ever published. Um, organic inorganic, aqueous, non-aqueous, monomer, oligomer, polymer, whatever. So why does that work? Well, we have the same uh, mechanism going on, this disproportionation mechanism. I haven't even drawn the arms anymore because they're inert. They're solubilizing, but inert. All the action is in the central ring where this is the reduced form and two of those come together to form the oxidized, uh, sorry, the oxidized form and the over-reduced form that loses its oxygen. So air exposure will give you back your oxygen, that's this, but this reaction involves water and produces hydroxide. And that means if you bring up the pH now, up to 14, you increase the hydroxide concentration by two orders of magnitude and drive this back to the left. So with the ether linkage, high pH breaks your arms, but with the carbon linkage, high pH actually helps. All right, oh, this is different on your computer than it is on mine, but I think it will be, <laughs> I think it'll be okay. Uh, we've got the water stability window here and just an overview of where the aqueous organic chemistries uh, look to me right now. The ones that are bold are stable enough to be commercializable. And then it's a matter of production cost and some other things. The ones that are not bold are just not stable enough. And what we've seen in neutral pH is about three years ago, we discovered a very, very stable combination of a functionalized ferrocene and a functionalized biologin, but the voltage between them is pretty low. And with other ferrocenes with higher potential, 
the stability isn't there. With other viologens with lower potential, the stability wasn't there. This year we published uh, a lower potential viologen that is truly stable. So maybe there's hope there for breaking that inverse correlation between stability uh, and voltage. In acid, we don't have anything that's quite stable enough. In base, ferrofericyanide is pretty good. It's cheaper than vanadium, not a whole heck of a lot cheaper than vanadium. It'd be nice to replace it, but it is cheaper. And down here, we have our Methuselah chemistries and our zombie uh, chemistry. Uh, and there's a new molecule I didn't mention before, phenazines, which were introduced by Pacific Northwest National Lab. They have lower potential than anything, but they're not stable enough. But there's a preprint now by Yunlong Ji, former postdoc with us now in his independent uh, career, that makes looks like he may have developed a very stable phenazine. So that's really interesting. Um, with these, it's a matter of what's the synthetic cost at mass production scale. And uh, if they fade, the, the, the ones that are not in bold, how much can we extend the uh, lifetime? So we're working hard on that right now. So uh, let me end by acknowledging our sources of support and pointing out Roy Gordon uh, in charge of the synthetic chemistry, Alana Spuruguzic, whose combinatorial theoretical team has calculated the properties of over a million different molecules for us. And then the main players in the work I told you about today are uh, Min Wu, Mark Anthony Goulet, uh, Kai Shang Lin, David Kwabi, uh, Yan Jing, and uh, Eric Fell, and Yunlong Ji. So, with that, I'll thank you for your attention. Be happy to answer questions. All right, Mike, thank you very much for your excellent talk. So, I'm getting a little bit of. Uh, distractions here. So uh, E, I might ask you to step in if things gets worse. Um, hopefully all the parents can appreciate this. Um, <clears throat> so we have a number of questions. So let me maybe start off with the, the chemistry side of things. Um, so Mike, you showed a tremendous progress on improving the calorie in life. This is really wonderful progress. Um, you know, as you go to those molecules with much better stability against decomposition, are there trade-offs? Um, are you losing something, for example, in the kinetics or solubility um, that you have to consider as well? Yeah, are there trade-offs? The what we we haven't seen trade-offs in solubility. We've been managing to to uh, solubilize those pretty well. The kinetics seem to get a little more sluggish. Our power density is down by a factor of two from DHAQ. Uh, we don't have systematic understanding of that. So I don't know if it's just uh, chance or if it's really something significant and systematic. The main trade-off is in synthetic cost because now you, uh, these molecules, you start with DHAQ and then you add other organics to give you the arms. And so the, the cost goes up. And it looks like right now that the cost of the, the truly stable molecules we've developed uh, is too high, even at mass production scale, to be competitive. Whereas for DHAQ, it looks low enough. So if we can extend the life of that adequately, then, we're, then uh, that's, that's still a win. We're, I mean, we continue to look at you know, the lessons learned in order to see whether we can develop infinite life molecules that are um, um, uh, low in mass production cost. And so for example, we now have one public, one synthetic method that starts with anthracene instead of anthraquinone. And anthracene is a cheaper, more abundant <clears throat> starting material than anthraquinone. Great, Mike, thanks so much. Um, it is, it's truly exciting to see the progress there. The next set of questions um, has to do with the membrane liquid interface. Um, you, you didn't have too much time to get into that. Could you speak to a, um, a bit about any potential um, opportunities and challenges when it comes to the electrode electrolyte interface or the membrane uh, interface um, that you're working on? So the, the membrane needs to in, in our aqueous organic chemistries, it needs to have high ion conductivity, excuse me, 
have a high ionic conductivity for the you know, monatomic ion that you're trying to pass and block the organics. Uh, uh, and the job is a bit easier when the organics are bigger. Uh, in many of our chemistries, uh, ferrocyanide is the fastest crossing species that you don't want to cross. Uh, and so we look for uh, membranes that have really good selectivity against crossing uh, the crossing of ferrocyanide. Our um, DHAQ original chemistry used a Nafion 212 membrane, but ferrocyanide does cross through that. More recently, we moved to a, a um, hydrocarbon membrane that's re that at mass production scale should be really cheap, like less than $25 per square meter. And it does a much better mm -hmm. job of blocking a ferrocyanide. Uh, we, it's very thin. So then there are trade-offs ab about uh, robustness and durability. And we may need to get, you know, if this were to be commercialized, you might need to make it thicker and live with a little bit more voltage loss in order to have the, the robustness you need. That's to be determined. Great, Mike. So, so related to that point, um, you mentioned that the degradation can be mostly regenerated um, by oxidation or other um, uh, chemical rays. Does this mean that there's also no significant increase uh, in the impedance at the various interfaces um, as the batteries operated? Yeah, we've seen no significant change in the impedance. Um, I should say, maybe our, our longest runs have been maybe six weeks. We, we'd love to run for a year, but you know our students are in a hurry to publish papers and graduate and our postdocs need to move on to their next positions. And usually in the academic scale, low battery, a piece of tubing bursts or something goes wrong with the program in the potentiostat or something. So I don't think we have any runs that have gone longer than six weeks. But at that level, we haven't seen substantial increases in impedance. We haven't found, um, so the decomposing molecules, when we, we lose them, we're, they're not like uh, polymerizing on the electrode and making it less active, for example. We haven't figured out where they're going uh, and we need to do that. And certainly over years, if you're gonna accumulate uh, schmutz from decomposing molecules, you'd need to understand where it goes or control where it goes. It may just go into little uh, particulates at the bottom of the tank. Um, it may turn into CO2. We, we don't know. And certainly to do any of this at a real commercial scale, you'd need to find out. But there's so far, no red lights. That's great to hear. Let's take two more questions. Um, so the next one is on your final slide, uh, which shows the stability window of water. And um, there's been a lot of um, excitement these days in, in water and salt electrolytes and, and other related chemistry. Um, what are some of the opportunities for employing a higher stability window solvent um, for, for your chemistries? I am a firm believer in aqueous solvent. I have not seen any evidence that non-aqueous solvents can have nearly the conductivity or nearly the low cost that would be required to make uh, a flow battery chemistry uh, competitive. Now, I am not a chemist, so I have limited vision, but in, in the range of my limited vision, that's what I see and that's why I stuck to aqueous chemistries. I should say, you know, uh, a lead acid battery gives you two volts and that's aqueous. So there's a thermodynamic stability window, but every th there are many things we use in our, in our society that are not stable thermodynamically. They are metastable. Uh, a PN junction is metastable, but that doesn't stop us from, from building our entire information technology on it. Right, so the, you know, the 1.23 volts isn't, it, it's a true thermodynamic limit if you want something to last forever, but the, there's certainly plenty of opportunity for metastability and it's, it's not crazy to imagine 
uh, a two volt aqueous battery if you can do it for lead acid. I, I think it's not crazy at all. Um, lithium ion batteries are also uh, meta stable and so is the primary alkaline batteries as well. So no, I think you make a great point there, Mike. So, so the final question is on the technical and economics uh, since you mentioned cost. And I'm very pleased to see that both you and George are really thinking about it very carefully and integrating that with your innovation and the technology side. Um, so there's one specific question and a more general question. The specific question was on your analysis of the vanadium redox flow battery. This is from uh, Steve living at ExxonMobil. Um, have you, in your cost analysis, did you consider the residual value of vanadium? The residual value of vanadium would turn, if, if you'll recall my slide on the trade-off, uh, uh, the, re uh, the replacement cost ratio of, of uh, replacing your organic versus vanadium, which lasts forever. So if you want to just take the vanadium and recycle it and put it back into your battery, that's the equivalent of turning your project life into an infinite life project. So the lowest curve of the family of curves uh, that I presented then represents um, inf an infinite life vanadium project. And then that's, that's the trade-off you'd look at there. Mm -hmm. You'd also um, need to know about the relative reconditioning cost of your system when you recondition organic. And I understand vanadium flow battery companies right now um, recondition, uh, they plan to recondition once every 10 years or so. So there's some unknown difference in reconditioning costs that could be put into that analysis as well. Great, Mike. So um, the, the fire, very final question, uh, again, on technical economics, is the balance of systems. Um, you know, so one of the distinguishing feature uh, between, say, lithium ion and uh, redox flow batteries is uh, a substantial difference in the energy density, uh, volumetrically, um, as well as graphometrically. Um, you know, we, we're beginning to see large deployments of lithium ion battery for, you know, four hour storage, and we'll touch more on this in the panel discussion. Um, you know, but the similar deployment size for flow batteries is, is considerably larger. Uh, I know there's been a lot of analysis on this already, but I wonder if you can share your own thoughts on sort of the, the chemistry costs and the balance of system costs when it comes to determine the total cost of storage and the, the, the importance of energy density in determining that ratio. Yeah, I'm, uh, that's a very reasonable question. I'm not an expert in that. I, I have not studied the balance of system costs uh, much. I know that flow batteries are out there and that they're competing and that you're not going to drive them. There was a, there was a lot a, a car company right, trying to uh, create a bunch of PR about a flow battery powered car. And I was very skeptical of that. Uh, but when you're, you know, you're talking about size, then it's going to matter where you want to put these things. If you want to store them, if, if you want to store energy in the middle of Manhattan, then uh, space constraints are going to be different than if you want to store them at the base of your wind, tur wind turbine or at the edge of your, your wind farm. So uh, important, important consideration. I just don't have, I don't have numbers for you. Well, maybe we can brainstorm this further. Um, let me thank you, Mike, again for the discussion and the presentation and invite uh, George and of course, uh, E back to the podium. And uh, we have about 20 minutes left and I hope we can have a spirited discussion on long duration storage. Um, e, would you like to kick us off? Yeah, sure. I'm listening to uh, both uh, Mike's and uh, George's talk is just fantastic and uh, think deeper about the long duration, what could be the uh, solution of choice right there. Um, so I have one question, um, you know, really coming from Mike, I appreciate your study a lot. I mean, this calendar life, actually you can have good cycle life, but calendar life can, can kill you if you don't uh, have a stable molecules right there. I mean, your, your progress is just amazing, the idea you put in. Uh, so 
this is for both Mike and George. You know, if I, I, I look at the past history of lithium ion, right, since 191, when lithium ion coming out, the cycle life, 200 cycles. Calendar life, maybe about a year, at most two years, that's it. And uh, fast forward in 2005, you know, that's about in, uh, up to 15 years. When I joined the Stanford faculty, that's why I used 2005. <laughs> Uh, well, the cycle life is about 500 for lithium. Uh, calendar life, you know, from the cell phone, you see, you know, probably three years, four years, that, that's about it. Now until now, right, that's about close to 30 years of lithium ion batteries. We have, you know, cycle life about a thousand for most of the most batteries, maybe a little bit more, you know, you know, some of the chemistry go to 2000, 3000. And the 30 years uh, uh, learning, I mean, the calendar life was seven, eight years, maybe 10, depending on how you use it. So what I mean right here about this lifetime issue, both cycle life and calendar life, what's your thought? How do we speed up this process and the development? Uh, and uh, we don't want to wait another 20, 30 years, right? To see, you know, that's the chemistry. We can have sufficient lifetime relevant to the grid scale storage. How, how, how do we do that? George, you mentioned your self-driving lab, very, very intriguing. So uh, can we do something about it? That's a, a wonderful question, Yi, and you put it uh, actually very, very well. So when you talk about the cost of the battery, you have to include in your thinking, what's the lifetime? If suddenly it were twice as, the lifetime were twice as much, you might say, well, the cost has been reduced by a factor of two. And uh, thinking like that, I think is gonna come more and more to the fore. So you, when we, we always try to get the cost down and we do that through the supply chain, we do that through uh, better technology, through better manufacturing, there's always a learning curve, which right now for batteries is probably 18%, which is quite remarkable. Uh, it's gonna, you know, that's gonna flatten out. And you'll be left with, with other issues. So you'll, and lifetime is one of them. Uh, and I, I think with, uh, there are many degradation uh, pathways in lithium ion, in, in flow batteries as well. Most of them are parasitic side reactions reactions that have nothing to do with storing or releasing energy, but use up the active material. So lithium reacts with something it's not supposed to and it's taken out of the, out of the charge discharge cycle. We can do a lot of that. And uh, in my sense, that is one place where R&D ought to go. Another, and I have two more, one uh, second one would be recycling. Uh, everybody knows we recycle lead acid batteries at nearly 100% and we hardly recycle lithium ion at all. Uh, that's partly because they're complicated and it's hard to get, you don't wanna come down to the elements in a lithium ion battery, it's too expensive. And then you're faced with re you know, reorganizing uh, those elements in the, in the new lithium ion battery. So you want to take out the cathode and reuse it without bringing it down to elements. Well, that's a promising direction. It's tough because it's a complicated system. I think with flow batteries, it's actually a lot easier. And it's easier to just drain the fluid and replace it. You could never do that with the lithium ion battery. Uh, Jay Caesar is looking, and we're not very far in, in this direction yet, but we're looking at the idea of self-healing. Uh, which is one of the reasons we like to work with oligomers. So you could imagine there's a bad monomer in an oligomer of let's say five or eight monomers, break the backbone, take out the bad monomer, put in a new one and find a way to have this happen automatically. Mm -hmm. So the, the battery will self-report time for a fix and somebody presses a button or maybe it just happens chemically and uh, the polymer chains break and are replenished. So I think that's actually an easier problem. Uh, and then you mentioned, this is the last one, <laughs> fascinating idea of the self-driving laboratory, which you know, we're using to discover organic molecules, but you could use it to discover anything. Uh, and there are lots of other materials you'd like to apply that to within let's say lithium ion batteries, but you can apply it also to processes. 
So one thing we're looking at is can you simplify the synthesis of an organic molecule by trying lots of synthesis routes and learning automatically with, in principle, no human intervention, uh, a synthesis route which is either cheaper or faster or whatever your goal is. You could apply that to lifetime. Let's look at the degradation. Let's look at many ways of addressing the degradation and start ranking them and, and, and learn on every cycle how to do it better. I, I, my feeling, it's a very powerful technique. Remarkably, you don't have to understand why it works. You just have to know that it does work. And I think artificial intelligence, machine learning, very good at finding things that work without understanding why. So that's, it adds a new dimension, I think, to the, to the R&D space. Mike, do you have a comment on this question? Uh, yeah, a, a couple of comments. Uh, one thing we need to do is find accelerated ways of evaluating lifetime because we're looking for lifetimes of years to decades. And so it, you just can't make rapid progress by setting something up and letting it run for that long. So we're building now to do ex uh, high temperature uh, experiments where we systematically vary the temperature. There you have to understand the mechanism. So if you get shorter lifetime at high temperature, you need to understand the mechanism well enough to know if that mechanism is still what's going to be limiting your lifetime at room temperature or operating temperature, which might be a little bit higher than that. So this is a, a tedious kind of set of experiments to do, but we're setting up to do that now. Um, and in terms of machine learning, I think there is a lot of potential there, but I should say when we started in this with, um, with Alan's team, we you know, wrote proposals about machine learning and how the uh, combinatorial theoretical chemistry was going to lead the way. Every single significant advance that we've made came from the creativity of a benchtop researcher with, you know, gloved hands. And once that insight was there, the theory was great for fleshing out all the associated possibilities and optimizing around that and understanding what's going on. But the insight in every case was, you know, a creative student or, or postdoc experimentalist uh, who had an idea and made something. So sooner or later, the, the, um, the machines are going to lead the way in that. But in our experience, it hasn't happened yet. Thank you, Mike. We'll pass back to you. Yeah, uh, thank you very much. I, I, I want to actually expand on this discussion. This is something uh, that's very uh, near and dear to my heart on accelerating R&D. And, and Mike, I think you described it perfectly. Um, you know, for electrochemical energy storage technology, one of the biggest problems is that they last so long and it makes assessment and evaluation very challenging. So if I were to combine what George uh, and Mike, you said, you know, George, you talked about how to navigate design spaces, right? So the idea of using a robot really can help there by making thousands of compounds. And, and Mike, you talked about forecasting, right? So if you can forecast um, the behavior of the molecule into the future and take the two methods together, you can really decrease um, the R&D time. So I think this sounds extremely attractive. I, I wanted to see if I can probe a little bit deeper to understand in the area of flow battery, what is the bottleneck right now? Is it the synthesis time to make the molecules? Is it making the cell, someone assembling the cell? Or as Mike, you said, is it, is it just putting on the test bench and, and degrading the battery? What is the time controlling part of the R&D process right now? Well, let me offer my, my point of view on that. The, the synthesis, the conceptualization can happen quickly getting the synthesis to work and getting to adequate purity that you can um, you know, get high enough yield and adequate purity that you can do some experiments with it and claim that the results you see are the results of a single molecule, that takes time. I mean, that, that can take a couple months 
uh, for a, a student or, or a postdoc to do something like that. And once that happens, then there's the battery of tests we do, and that can take less time. That can be pretty quick unless you're trying to do the long-term stability experiments, and then those, those can stretch out as well. Uh, but I, I guess the, the big bottleneck in the research then is the synthesis. Uh, and especially because we, we're building up to having accelerated ways of doing testing. In, in terms of going out and making the world a better place, the bottleneck is mass production because we're coming up with these specialty chemicals uh, and you know, they're, they're just the chemicals can be $1,000 a kilowatt hour at the specialty chemicals uh, price point. So uh, there, there has to be a way of getting over the barrier to getting to cheap mass production. And you know, our indications are example for you know, a DHAQ factory, you're, you're talking about $180 million or something like that. And that's not, not an easy thing to come up with. You Money know, is always rate limiting, right? Okay, so that's a good point. Uh, George? Yeah, those are great comments, Mike. And I think the question of where is the bottleneck is really the question we should ask. And hopefully we'll address one bottleneck, maybe remove it or reduce it and then go on to the next bottleneck because it's never just one. But uh, to me, uh, and I might agree with your statements about it's the creativity of a bench researcher, which so far has made all the difference. And I think we ought to learn from that. And the lesson I would learn from that is just trying a lot of random things because I can think of them isn't, isn't the way to go. And some of our machine learning, it's beyond that point, but it hasn't yet got to the point where it competes with uh, a, a brilliant or let's say creative bench worker. I, I'm thinking though, <laughs> historically about computers playing games, they could never beat chess masters for the longest time. Now chess masters cannot beat a machine period. And so we're not there yet with uh, self-driving labs for sure, but uh, it's a very versatile idea. But the bottle, getting back to the bottleneck, uh, to me, it is uh, the vast variety of organic molecules which are around. So even within one family, and I showed a couple of examples of making 10 you know, different derivatives of a, of a basic molecule, and they all had different either, uh, well, they all had different electrochemical properties or solubility properties or you know, go, the list goes on. Um, and how to predict in advance, even for a creative benchtop scientist, that one's gonna work and that one's not. It's a real tough one. So there's, as you said, Mike, there's still this, call it synthesis, synthesis or maybe it's just trying enough things uh, even if the synthesis is easy. Uh, and to me, that's the uh, challenge. So I'd like to have either a, uh, uh, a, a good enough knowledge, intuitive, of what works and what doesn't work, or just have a database that has that kind of information hidden in it and use machine learning and artificial intelligence to bring out the patterns and realize you know, what works and what doesn't work. Uh, I think that's, uh, I don't want to say it's a bigger bottleneck than synthesis, probably it isn't, uh, but uh, when it comes to synthesis, I remember the, the learning curves of solar panels and, uh, and batteries. It takes about 10 years to get the price down to where it's really competitive, and I could imagine we're going to have to look at that 10 years for some of the materials in flow batteries, the, the complicated organic ones, but it is possible to get the price down. And uh, in the practical world, it really is the price that counts. We, we can talk about wanting to address climate change and reduce emissions. We should do that. But until it's comparably priced, either by policy or just by the market, it's going to be a tough one, I think. George, thank you very much. Um, maybe I can since we're talking about cost, uh, maybe I can get the both of you to comment on, I think, two 
flagship projects on the flow battery side and on the lithium ion battery side for stationary storage in, in terms of energy stored. So uh, Mike, you already mentioned one, um, the vanadium flow battery in Dalian, China by Lunker. And um, another one that comes to mind, uh, it's a local one here in Monterey, California. So uh, pg and &E, Tesla, and Vesta Energy are putting in a nearly one gigawatt hour system uh, at Moss Landing. And I, I think first, it's just tremendous to see that we're deploying at gigawatt hour now, um, today. Um, I was wondering if the both of you could uh, uh, discuss these real life scenarios and examples of deployment uh, for both the flow battery and the lithium ion battery side and, and, and talk about what, what do you think we can learn from them? Um, how would this drive the R&D? So this MOS landing system is vanadium or lithium? Uh, li li lithium ion. So this is a Tesla uh, conventional lithium ion. Yeah, one gigawatt, about one gigawatt hour. How many hours? Four hours. Four hours. So um, as George pointed out, you know, lithium ion is really good and at short discharge durations. Uh, it can reach four hours now and you know, his, his, the line George drew was six hours. Uh, that line may move up a bit over time. Uh, it depends on what happens to the tra trajectory of lithium ion battery uh, prices. So. If, if people have asked whether lithium ion batteries will become the Chinese single crystal silicon photovoltaics of storage and just crush everything else because of uh, the learning curve, it's been able to come down. And for discharge durations up to some single digit number of hours, that's probably, it looks like it's probably going to be the case. And what, what we have to deal with is what happens beyond that, what happens in the tens, tens of hours to hundreds to seasonal storage. Yeah, I would agree, Mike. And a uh, couple of comments on the learning curve, which I think is critical and often overlooked. Uh, I remember 2017, and again, it was Tesla, installed a 100 uh, megawatt hour battery in South Australia, a big gamble. That was the biggest uh, installation at that time. Uh, and everybody was waiting to see how it works. And after a year, and I think remarkably, it seemed to be working pretty well. You know, there were no problems. And that gave everyone a lot of confidence. Well, let's try some bigger batteries now. Now we're up to a gigawatt. So, uh, and Moss Landing will be another test point. It, each time we break another uh, sort of uh, size limit, we wait and see what's going to go wrong with it and how can we fix it? But it happened remarkably fast. So from 2017 to 2020, three years, we went from 100 megawatts to a gigawatt installation, which means that we have a lot of confidence that it's really going to work. Uh, and I can see, as Mike pointed out, if it's less than four hours, hard to beat lithium ion. It's going to get cheaper. It's going to get better. Uh, nothing else is close to it now. So uh, that's our battery. But when it comes to other, uh, uh, other applications, there are certain things that lithium ion just can't do. I mean, one that comes to mind is uh, aviation. Uh, takes about 800 watt hours per kilogram to fly a plane, a regional plane, 600 miles full of say 50 or 100 people. And lithium ion is never gonna do that. So you've got to look at other things like lithium oxygen, for example, gets a lot of attention. And we've been talking about long duration. I don't think you're going to make a lithium ion battery discharge for 150 hours like Form Energies. Uh, it's a flow bat water inorganic flow battery like it does. So you may look at that battery, Form Energies battery, and say maybe that's the next lithium ion, quote unquote, for long duration because it's got a head start. There's nothing else in that space at the moment. It's definitely going to get better. And this one installation in Minnesota with Great River Energy will tell us, can it work? Is it going to fail? Did we overlook something? How can we make it better? I think that learning curve, it's not a cost learning curve. It's just a technology learning curve. It's going to be really fast 
for, uh, for that battery and, and other long duration batteries. So I, uh, I, you know, I, I would be optimistic that my feeling is there are more applications that lithium ion can't do than there are applications it can do. And there's a lot of space out there waiting. Lithium ion is cost, it's gonna cost three revolutions. Personal electronics, it was absolutely responsible for that. Uh, electric vehicles, it's on the way at the personal car level, not necessarily at the heavy duty freight truck level or at the you know, uh, maritime shipping level, but it's on the way. And the grid is coming too, but not everything in the grid can be addressed with lithium ion, just as not everything in transportation can be addressed with lithium ion. So I, I think there's plenty of room for flow batteries and, and, and other technologies beyond lithium ion to fill that space. Let me add just a little bit to that. Oh, uh, Mike, go ahead. Yeah. Um, there's, there's a huge space between, say, six hours where lithium ion may become just not competitive and 100 plus hours where form energy is targeting, right? In the tens of hours there, there's, there's enormous space, enormous market, and um, a lot of opportunities. Um, and the second thing I wanted to say is whenever you assemble a very large amount of energy in one place, you have to worry about sudden accidental catastrophic release of that energy. And we've seen fires from lithium ion battery installations as well as sodium sulfur battery installations. And so you know, safety becomes more and more important as you get to larger scale. Yeah, let, let me inject a little bit on, on this topic. Um, if I look at the levelized, levelized cost of uh, storage per kilowatt hour, one third, it's only about one third, right? it's the capex, it's your lithium ion batteries or the flow batteries, the, um, the installation. And then there could be a third coming from maintenance, air conditioning and, and, and things you put that you need to maintain. And it is a third, it's actually financing. So, and from that perspective, that could change the analysis, the equation. Uh, we mostly uh, talk about the capex, and then this opex, this you know financing cost. I think lithium ion is going up because of people's confidence is getting high with all this experimental uh, uh, project going. Uh, that will help the financing one. Uh, will help the financing the you know the lifetime confidence you know and, and so on. So would there be anything, let's say, um, for the flow batteries that could have impact on how people think about operational costs and as well as the financing costs, you know, to speed up the, uh, the flow batteries, uh, whether it's aqueous or non-aqueous solution. I'm, I'm thinking about it just for brainstorming. If I can comment, yeah, I think that's a that's a great question to address, and uh, we we know so little about flow batteries. Not that we haven't studied them in the lab, we have, but out in the real world, the applications world, and I think uh, we're going to learn a lot. I, I've heard people who are lithium-ion battery fans say, "Why would you want, uh, you know, an organic flow battery? It's basically a chemical plant with all the safety hazards and other hazards." that you have to deal with that nobody knows uh, what to do with because there's not very much experience out there. But as the experience comes, I think we're gonna become comfortable. And it's more, it's as much psychological as it is technical. Uh, after, after we become technically comfortable, we become psychologically comfortable. I I'm, I'm always come back to the uh, example of filling my car with gasoline. And if I think how much energy is running through my hand as I hold the hose and what it could do if it exploded, it's huge. And yet we all, everyone in the general public does that all the time and never thinks about it. We're psychologically very, very comfortable with that. I, I, I think we will get to that point with, with flow batteries. We'd have to get them out there 
and I, I would, I'm not a policymaker, but I would think one of the things uh, all governments should do is find ways to, to encourage the actual deployment of, of technologies like flow batteries, which are basically ready to be uh, out there in sort of pilot form to see how they work. And it's a very good investment in the sense if it doesn't work, you'd like to know that early and you can go on to something else. Uh, and, but we're, we're at that point in the energy transition, things are happening quickly and new opportunities are arising. So I, 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 I'm, I believe that they ought to be, they ought to be tried uh, in demonstration uh, you know, form. Yeah, thanks, George. Well, we're circulating back to you. Yeah, I think we are um, at the end of our time here. So uh, I'm just actually reading from the Q&A. It looks like uh, our great colleague, Stan Wintingham, would like to have the final word. So I will just read his comment uh, verbatim. So Stan wants to make a comment on um, the four hour uh, duration for lithium ion batteries. So, so he said, presently storage is limited to four hours because that is all the Federal Energy uh, Regulatory Commission allows for cost recovery. So I think the regulatory consideration is significant even for lithium ion. So thank you, Stan, very much for that comment as well. So I would like to thank you both again, George and Mike, uh, for a really great discussion. Uh, I'm sorry that there's not more time to do it, but I think one of these days we'll all get together in person and, and, and do this much more extensively. Uh, so oh, if I can, thank you, Mike. Thank you, George. And if I could have the slide, please. We're done for this year. I wish everyone uh, a very happy holiday, safe, uh, stay well. Uh, so returning uh, January 15th, we will have two distinguished speakers to kick us off in 2021, which I'm very hopeful it's a better year. Uh, Jeff Don from Dalhousie University, uh, who is an expert on lithium ion batteries, uh, and Professor Yasha Horn at MIT, uh, who has been developing uh, chemistry and fundamentals of uh, various energy storage and conversion technology. Uh, so thank you again all for joining us today and uh, have a, a safe remainder 2020.